Apologetics Month, and we're going through answering questions about the Bible this month. Do you believe the Bible is the Word of God? Do you believe it's inerrant? <laughs> That's awesome. What God speaks is inerrant. What God says is infallible. What man copies has problems. Amen? I don't know how else to tell you. So we're going through because even though we have problems in our language, there isn't really much problem from the original. Even though some languages have ceased to exist, the original Hebrew, you know we don't have that language anymore. But as it has changed and developed, we know we can trust what the Bible says. And so we're trying to find truth. Listen, God don't need help defending. People need help in understanding. And that's what we're doing. We're just giving some clarifications. So when we talked about the word of God is perfect, and I believe that, and I believe my translation, even though it has arrows, it's still infallible because you can trust it. So what I'm trying to do is answer some of these complications that the Bible has. And so everywhere we don't understand, we always know and go back to the original. Romans chapter 3, verse 4. Thank you. A little slow on that, weren't you? Everybody that was here last week, Romans chapter 3, verse 4, let God be true and every man a liar. That's the passage we're going. Every time I tell you Romans 3, 4, you say, okay, you'll catch on eventually. This is going to be another verse you're going to add to your memory, man. I'm going to saturate you with the word of God, but you've got to get it out. You've got to get it out. All right, so Romans 3, 4. Man, you guys are falling asleep quick on me, man. Come on. Don't make me make you stand up and do jumping jacks. Okay, so as I said before, God's word is perfect, but our English translations have problems, and you've got to address those problems, and you've got to know where we get our problems from. So this entire month, we are dealing with the Bible and answering its problems. Let me give you a short introduction, and we'll get into uh, some of the key text. Um, I'm going to address the King James Bible, and just like I told you last week, I said something was very hard for some of you to hear. God's word is perfect. But our translation has huge problems. Amen? Okay. Now I'm going to use a translation today called the King James Version. And I only use that because of this. It has the most problems in it. <laughs> Which is funny because I was told by old school pastors that the King James is the best translation ever. Amen, man? I'm telling you, man. I was hammered that into my thick skull. This is the Bible. This is the best job. Those are from the pits of hell. This is the only translation. And I find out the King James has more problems than any of them. Isn't that amazing? Romans 3, 4. Okay, all right. We'll get this one. We'll get this. By the end of the month, you'll have it down. I promise. All right. <laughs> so when we talk about the King James Bible... It has 783,137 words in it. And every time they translate that from the original Hebrew to Greek to English, they've got to deal with every single word. And it's got to be put in its context. Because some of the words have 27, I found one word's got 27 meanings. What does it mean in English? I don't know. You've got to figure out what the context is. Every word, 783,137, they had to go through every one of them to translate it. And so when we talk about our... Well, let's go back to the Hebrew. Let's go back. This is a slide of the original Hebrew text. Anybody read that? That's just some kabuki language to me. I have absolutely no clue. Just looks like hieroglyphics. It's like pictures. I don't know what pictures it looks like, but it's just, I have no clue. But that is a page, a copy of a page from a Hebrew manuscript. It goes from right to left. It doesn't read left to right. This is backwards. It goes right to left. There's no punctuation. There's no capitals, there's no paragraphs, it's one big long run on sentence. So if it's a book like Isaiah that has 66 chapters, you've just got page after page after page that's one long run on sentence. And when you come to the Greek language, you update it to the New Testament Greek language, yeah, that ain't much better. <laughs> Looks a little more like letters, right? But really it's just a bunch of stuff on a page. That's read from right to left. But they don't have any punctuation. They don't have any commas. They don't have any periods. They don't have any chapter segregations. They don't have anything. So when you look at the original, and then you go to the store, and you buy one that looks like this in English, and you have this, oh, my, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? 
There's Genesis. I've got verses. I've got chapters. I've got all kinds of stuff. I've got commas and punctuation and periods. Oh, my. I've got all kinds of stuff. How do we get from the original to this? Because there's stuff that we do in English that don't make sense in Hebrew and Greek. Their language structure. So, so if something is written in masculine, you know it's talking about a male. If something's written in feminine, you know it's talking about a female. But like if you go to Ephesians chapter 6, it translates into English, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. That word is actually spoken neutral. So you know what a better rendition would be? Parents. Parents, don't raise your children up in anger. Okay, so now it's easy to do that Greek and Hebrew stuff, but when you get to English, you got problems. Now, this is the ESV version, Luke chapter 23, uh, verse 32, and it says, Two others, comma, who were criminals, comma, were led away to be put to death with him. And you say, okay, that makes sense. So there's two criminals that were led with Jesus, and they were going to die with him, but they were the criminals. But now listen to the Wycliffe Bible, because the Wycliffe translation has no commas. It says, also, and other two wicked men were led with him to be slain. Now, I'm not sure that the guy, I don't know anything about English, so I'm not going to even try to tell you that that makes perfect sense. But I know that without commas, and I know with the word with, were led with him, would indicate kind of that Jesus was a criminal too. Does that make sense? He was an innocent man. Even Pilate said he was innocent. So here we have one translation that's got commas, separating stuff. Here you have another translation that doesn't have any commas. And it kind of would insinuate that Jesus might be wicked. Now, if you're looking for the perfect word-for-word -word translation, the absolute best word-for-word -word translation is the interlinear Bible. The interlinear Bible translates the words from Hebrew to English exactly as they're positioned in the original Hebrew and Greek. Okay? That's the interlinear. But the problem is, if you do that, you have the closest word-for-word -word translation in the interlinear. But this is how it reads. We're being led now away criminals, also other two with death to be put. Where's the hymn? Doesn't even have him in there. So all that stuff in your Bible that's italicized, we add English words so that it makes sense. So what we got to do, and I'm not an English major, but even I know that doesn't make any sense. So we have to take every word, we have to redo it, and you got to have the noun and the adjective that describes it, and you got to redo the whole sentence so it makes English sense. So you're going from Hebrew and Greek to English, and we lose a lot in the translation. That's a lot of stuff, man. When we talk about the King James, here's one of the other problems. By the time 1611 King James was made, the king's translators, they only knew classical Greek. What was the original Greek written in? Anybody know? Matt? Koine Greek. It was written in Koine Greek. But by the time 1611 translators, they only knew classical Greek. And you're like, well, how the heck do we even know we got the original Bible? How do we even know the translation is even correct? Why? Because language changes. But actually, Hebrew and Greek, they stick pretty close to the same. So you can still get the idea. We're going to talk about that. So here's, here's a fun one. I love doing this. Even though we've lost a lot in the Hebrew language, we, we, still, we still understand pretty much the original. The original Hebrew, gone. But we've got enough from the way it's changed to understand we've got the truth from the beginning. All right. So how many of you believe in unicorns? Oh, such fancy little pixie creatures. Oh, they're so wonderful. You don't believe in unicorns? Come on. Nobody believes in unicorns? How dare you? Because here's the problem. That's found in your King James Bible. And if your King James is infallible, absolutely without error, then you have to believe in unicorns. Listen to Isaiah chapter uh, 34, verse 7. King James says, and the unicorns. Oh, how lovely. Do you believe in unicorns? I don't either. So why does the Bible say unicorns? Right? 
Okay, I can't answer that one today because it, it comes much later, <laughs> much later into the five and 600 ADs, why we have that word in there. And I'll explain that as we go on when we get into the New Testament. So sorry if you want an answer right now. Now, do you believe in satyrs? You know what a satyr is? Anybody know what a satyr is? Outside of Matt. I know he knows it. Next slide. Okay, this is a satyr. It's a he-goat, like a he-man goat. So the one on the left is from the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. You ever seen that? That's awesome. Fancy, fantasy, you know, sci-fi. It's not real. One on the right is uh, Danny DeVito in Hercules. Have you seen that one? Oh. Uh, it's a good movie. But here's the thing. Do you believe in satyrs? I don't believe in satyrs. But if your Bible is infallible, without error, and you believe the King James, if he said it, it's good enough for Jesus, good enough for us. Right? Okay. Back to Isaiah chapter 13, verse 21. But the wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. Owls shall be there, and the satyrs are going to dance there. So these he-goat men, half-man, half-goat, is going to be dancing wherever these other creatures are. Do you believe that? Then why is it in there? Because the problem is, an atheist will go to every translation that has problems, and mostly the King James, not to be rude, but mostly the King James, who has the most problems, and they'll point out this stuff, and they'll go, so is your Bible in error? Oh, yeah, it's the Word of God. Is it without error? It's infallible. Okay, do you believe in unicorns? No. There you go. Why is that in there? I don't know. Like, oh, okay. Well, what else is in your Bible that's wrong? Well, I, I don't know. And people begin to question it. Nothing wrong with questioning the Bible. Amen? Because when you find the answers, it'll absolutely make you stronger in your foundational defense. Right? And that's what we're trying to do. I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm just trying to give you some hard things to understand. Now, I know these are kind of funny. These are, are funny little things. But the problem is, is there's some real serious ones, too. Do you believe that God created evil? you got to answer that question. Did God create evil? Yes. How many say yes? Sweet. How many say no? Are you going to stand that God did not create evil? Right? You're going to stand on that? Are you going to stand on that? Okay. I'll stand on it too. I mean, I'll stand right there with you. And I'll have Matt in front of me because he'd be like, you know, defending everybody that comes against us. But here's the problem. I know and understand what the Bible says. God did not create evil. It's an understanding that God is good. We don't have time to get into it, but Luke 8, 18 to 19, it says, good, good teacher. Why? And then Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's only one good. That's God. But then the absence of goodness is evil. So it's not God. He doesn't create anything. It's the absence of God is evil. So anybody that is not like God is evil, right? God didn't create it. And you'll stand by that, right? Awesome. Isaiah 45. The King James says, I form the light. I create darkness. I make peace. And I create evil. Oh, well, that's just talking about somebody else. No, it isn't. I, the Lord, do all these things. Oh, okay. So God says that he creates evil. You just told me God didn't create evil. And I just showed you from your Bible that's inerrant, without error, infallible, where you're wrong. Defend yourself. And you can't. And you're like, wow. Yeah, I guess God did create evil. And what happens is if you don't have an understanding where any of this stuff comes from, you're usually like, well, maybe I am wrong. Maybe I'm wrong about God, too. Maybe I'm wrong about salvation. Maybe I'm wrong about hell and eternal life. Maybe this is the only thing in here. And you just start to go left and left and left and left until you're gone. And you walk away because you don't have an understanding. You don't have a defense of why you believe what you believe. If you've been here any length of time, you know me. I'm going to saturate you with the word of God. And I will give you a defense so that you can have one heck of a firm foundation. And even though I understand the Bible has problems, by the end of this month, I'm hoping you're going to understand like, wow, yeah, it's still infallible. Praise God. Amen? All right. Here's a, in 1631, I forget how many 
By 1689, or 1789, I think there was like 10 different revisions of the 1611. So even though you have a King James Version, it's not 1611. There's so many revisions that have been. 1631 version, there were thousands of copies that were printed. And this is awesome, because not because of this. But you understand that the Bible was translated wrong. And so King Charles I, he had all of them uh, burn up, except for 10. 10 remained. And here's the problem. In Exodus 20, where it talks about the Ten Commandments. Yep, that one right there. Thou shalt commit adultery. What? God says it. I got to do it. So it's, God says thou shalt. But no, it's a mistranslation. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. But thou shalt commit adultery. It was a mystery. Matter of fact, 10 of them survived the fire. And in 2015, one of those copies sold for $40,000. I'm going to create an own Bible, have all kinds of problems, and then just try to sell it for money. You're like, this is a Zedeker translation. It's got all kinds of problems. Who can be 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, No. All right. Let's pray. Let's get into this. We've got a lot to go over. Um, next slide, please. This is what I want you to see and understand before we pray. Psalm 119.18. The NLT says this. God opened my eyes to see wonderful truths in your instructions. That is going to be my prayer this morning. Let's pray. Father, I pray that your spirit would open our spiritual eyes this morning so that we can see so many wonderful truths that are found in your word that will give us a defense based off of just truth. Lord, we want you to be true and every man a liar. We don't understand all things, and we don't. We won't understand everything. But what you've left for us to understand, we, we can. We can get it, and we get the message you have left for us. And I pray, God, that we would do that this morning. Open our eyes. Show us some awesome things from your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, when we talk about translations, we talk about problems with translations, I want you to understand two words. If you don't get anything from this morning, get these two things. Number one is etymology. Etymology is the study of the origins of words and the way in which their meanings have changed throughout history. People who are much older than I am probably remember you'd go into a bar to get stoned. And that was just a word that meant drunk, right? It was intoxicated. But over time, that word changed to become something else. You're smoking something to get stoned now instead of alcohol. But as you see the word changes, the definition doesn't. It's something of intoxicate, something that controls you. This was alcohol originally. Now it's something that you smoke potentially, right? So you get the, you get the word, the word changes, but the definition doesn't. It's kind of the same, and that's neat. So that's etymology, words and how they've changed. Now, the second thing is taxonomy. Taxonomy is the branch of science that is concerned with classification, especially of organisms, uh, a systematic classifications. Now, if you know anything about modern-day taxonomy, they, um, they, they, they have domains, they have kingdoms. Uh, next slide. The, the class, order, family, genus, species, all that stuff. Man, so if you talk about science, modern-day science, what are, you, are you talking about the kingdom, the phylum, the genus, the species? Which are you talking about? I don't know. Well, I ain't talking about none of that stuff. Because when it comes to the Bible, I'm talking about Old Testament Hebrew. Because they have a different taxonomy system than America does. And so the people in the old Hebrew times, you don't interpret the Bible from modern-day times. Hello? You don't interpret it today. You go back to the original. Hebrew people, they were literally, what they see is what they saw is what they documented. That's all it was. What they saw, that's what they give the, oh, there's a hopper. What's that? That's a hopper. What's a bunny? Yeah. Oh, there's another hopper. No, that's a grasshopper. That's different than a bunny. Well, they both hop, so they're hoppers. That's just what they did, right? Well, if you don't know, that now you do. Now, we talked about last week, Leviticus 11.6. And it talked about the bunny. It said the hair, because it chews the cud, but does not part the hoof, is unclean to you. But a bunny rabbit doesn't chew a cud like a, like a cow does, right? A cow's got four stomachs, right? 
And out of those four stomachs, it chews it, goes back in, regurgitates it. Do that. Does a rabbit do that? No. No, it doesn't. Matter of fact, as soon as it eats it, it just bloop, goes right out of it. And so now you've got a problem. Well, what do I do? The rabbit doesn't chew the cud. Okay, are you using modern-day English taxonomy? Or you are using the original Hebrew? Because if you go back to the original Hebrew, you find out the word or phrase, choose the cud, means to restore, to take up, to collect, to recover, or to regurgitate. <laughs> so which five of those definitions implies here? Well, I don't know. Because you go to the Bible and you say, that's why, you know how I tell you to do word studies? Huh? If you've never heard me say that, do a word study. You'll find out all kinds of wonderful stuff. Because that same phrase, choose the cud, the original Hebrew phrase, it's actually one word. It, it also is translated about money, talks about money, talks about swords, talks about the Ark of the Covenant. So you, are you taking, are you regurgitating the Ark of the Covenant? Okay, so that word doesn't fit. We're taking up the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, yeah, that might. Oh, we're recovering the Ark of the Okay, yeah, that fits because it was taken from us. So you gotta, you got to figure out how those words fit in there. And that's what the translators did. Because one word can mean 27 different things. Now, if you understand modern day taxonomy of a rabbit, you know that they do what's called refraction or kapofragi. Kapofragi. God. So anyway, let me just go to what, not to be gross, but they go back and they eat their poop again. Because what happens is they don't digest it completely from the beginning. So when they go back to it, it it's got protein and stuff still in there. So they got to go back to it and eat it again. Oh, so it's to recover. Is that one of the definition of words? Yes, it is. So is a hair part of like chewing the cud? Yes. Why do they say that? Because that's what it looked like. That's what what looked like. That's what a rabbit looked like. And I'm sure you probably told your husband that. Well, you close your mouth. You look like a cow. Just what the Hebrew people do, right? They just look like a cow. A little rabbit going, that's just what a cow does. They're like, oh, he's chewing the cud. That's modern day stuff, but that's just how they said it back in Hebrew times. Now, we do the same stuff today, don't we? Because you do things, you don't say things scientifically. You just say them how you see them, Right? Did anybody see the wonderful earth revolving last night? Oh, it was beautiful. This morning it was raining, so we couldn't see the lovely earth revolving. Anybody say that? No, because you say sunrise and sunset. This is my favorite. I love when atheists say that. Oh, you, you dumb Christians, you just say sunrise and sunset. The earth doesn't, the sun doesn't rise. The earth revolves around it. It's an earth revolving. Oh, so you say earth revolving? Well, no, it's a sunrise. What are you ridiculing me for? That's just how we say it. Do you know reporters still say, I'm Dan Zedeker reporting from the four corners of the earth. <laughs> you science deniers, the earth's round. It's not flat and we don't have four corners. Well, why do they say that though? That's just an expression. That's just how we talk. We do it all the time, man. But man, people point that out and you go, oh yeah, you're right. But you still don't, even though that's scientific, you still don't go walking around being scientific, do you? I can't wait till the sun comes out tomorrow so I can see the lovely earth revolving. It's going to be beautiful. That's dumb. That's not how we talk. And that's not how the Hebrew people talked either. They just talked how they saw it. They just saw it. They just described it. And that's what we do. So Leviticus 11, 13 through 19, we don't want to go back there and talk about that. But it said that bats were birds. And that's a big fruit bat. Man, I'd love to have one of those. If I could have that and I could license that sucker, it'd be right here with me preach. I'd have it on my arm. Or I'd have it on Matt's arm because I couldn't hold that thing up all that long. That'd be awesome. Now, is a bat a bird? That's the question. Birds lay eggs. A bat has little babies. <laughs> it's a mammal. Is a mammal a bird? No. Okay, so Hebrew or modern day English? See, so what you're doing is you're interpreting the Bible that was written thousands of years ago for Hebrew people that just saw stuff, and they're like, yeah, okay, this is what it is. Modern-day taxonomy, a bat is a mammal, not a bird. You go back into the Hebrew, it's called a bird. Why? 
Because according to the English lexicon of dictionary words in the Hebrew language of the Semitic domains, a Hebrew bird was anything that had wings and flied. Is a bat a bird according to Hebrew? Absolutely. Is a grasshopper a bird? Absolutely. It's got wings and it flies. Oh, according to Hebrew. Oh, not modern day. So which are you talking about? you got to define your terms, and you got to figure out whether you're talking about up-to-date English modern day, or you're going back to the Hebrew. See, this is where we get confused, because they want to interpret the Bible from today. And you can't do that. It wasn't written today. Your translation might be, but the original was written thousands of years ago. Had 40 different writers in over 1,500 different years. Do you know that? How amazing. And it all jutes and jives. How wonderful. Some of this stuff is a little hard to understand. Now, a penguin is considered a bird, right? It has wings, but it doesn't fly. So according to Hebrew, a penguin would not be a bird. That's awesome. That's, I'll throw that in there. That's for free. So sometimes the Bible gives us some hard things to understand. And uh, next week, I want you to look up the verse where it says that God is going to send a lying spirit. We're going to, de- we're going to deal with that one. <laughs> I'm going to try. I'm going to try. We got a lot of stuff to go through. Do you know God sent a lying spirit? You know what Titus 1 2 says? God who cannot lie. You know, like God sent a lying spirit. What the heck's going on? I don't understand it. I don't even know the God yet. Yes, I know because you don't read his word. But that's the way you got to start. You got to start by reading his word. And he, <laughs> he sent the lying spirit and God blessed it. Whew. That will shake up your faith. Chew on that. For, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Well, no, we don't advocate smoking. Um, <laughs> all right. There are some hard things to understand. we got to get into this because I'm running out of time. So in 2 Kings chapter 24, verse 48, Jehoiakim was 18 years old. This is at the end of the southern kingdom, Judah, uh, the northern kingdom, uh, Israel. They had already been taken captive by the Assyrians. They're out of the way. So the southern kingdom, Judah, this is during the Babylonian Empire. This is towards the very end. Uh, Jehoiakim, who is the nephew of Zedekiah, I forget his Hebrew name, but Nebuchadnezzar changed it to Zedekiah. That's a Babylonian name. But uh, in 2 Kings 24, 8, it says, Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. And his mother's name was Nehusha, the daughter of El Nephilim of Jerusalem. And so what happens is, is you read 2 Kings, and then you go to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 9, and it says Jehoiakim was eight years old. And you go, wait, go back one. He was 18. Go forward. <clears throat> now he's eight. Okay. You'd be like, okay, that's simple. That's just a translation problem. Somebody didn't copy that down right, right? So if you have an eight and you forget to put the one, you'd either think it was eight or 18. Now this is really going to shake you up. <laughs> this is really going to make somebody mad. Was it eight or 18? Or was it 80? What? What do you mean 80? Next slide. This is a copy of the original Hebrew word. And this is funny. It's funny to me. So just humor me. This is the word right here. And it's read from right to left. These are consonants. The Hebrew language does not have vowels. They have consonants. These dots were added many years later, thousands of years later, to make these little vowels. The consonants didn't have vowels, so you had to pronounce it the best you could. Now, this little accent dot here is on the right side, so that makes this letter. This is the letter S in Hebrew. So with the accent on the right, it makes this an SH sound. So that word is pronounced shemone. All right, you just learned Hebrew. Amen? Now you got another language behind your belt. That's awesome. You guys are fluent. But the problem is, now pay attention, because I'm, I'm going to go through this really quick, and you're going to have to pay attention. Okay, this word right here, shemone, it means eight. Okay, do you got that? Okay, now pay attention, because we're going to, okay, now the next one, this one right here, shemone, that means 18. Okay, do you got that? Okay, now hang on, because I'm going to go faster. Shemone, this word here, that means 80. 
Translated from the Hebrew, 8, 18, and 80. So was Jehoiakim 8, 18, or 80? Because that one word right there means three different numbers. You're like, oh, Danny, I'm just going home right now. I'm going back to another church where they just say, God loves you. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Let me give you one verse. Now I'm giving you some hard stuff to understand. That's what Peter said. The stuff in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, 16 said that the stuff that Paul wrote, some of those things were hard to understand. And I'm giving you some stuff that's hard to understand. Anybody that translates that wrong and gets Jehoiakim is either 8, 18, or 80, I am not going to say one word to that guy. Because I don't want to translate it. So number one, it could be a copyist there, because that means three different things. Number two, it could be because kings of those times, and there was another king documented in the Bible, he was a co-ruler with his father. So not only was his father the king, but his son, when he got to a certain age, became co-regent. And so there was dual rulership. So was he eight years old when he became the dual rulership with his father? And then when his father died and he turned 18, then he become king? I don't know. Was he eight, 18, or 80? I don't know. Let me ask you this question. Even though there's a problem in our English translation or even from the original Hebrew, does that take away from the fact that there was a man named Jehoiakim who reigned and ruled in Judah and Jerusalem when it was taken by Nebuchadnezzar? No. And even if I don't have the Bible, I've still got the Babylonian records that absolutely records with 100% accuracy the same thing that the Bible says. Jehoiakim lived, he ruled and reigned from Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar came down, took him captive, and then he allowed him to live out his days in Babylon. The same thing that the Bible says. Is it historically accurate? Sure is. Does Babylon records say how old he was? Nope. Is it relevant? Absolutely not. What was the Bible written for? So you can have salvation in God, right? Amen? So who cares how old he was? Well, it's a problem, Danny, because there's errors in the Bible. So? It doesn't matter. You wait till we talk about Shakespeare. Man, you're going to have such a defense with the Bible, just with Shakespeare himself. Man, that's crazy. What do you mean by that? Well, we'll get to it. You just have to come back. I'm not going to give you all this stuff today. All right, so here's the thing. Whenever we have problems in our translation, it's not, it's not a problem. God's word is still infallible, even though we have well-intentioned copyists who still made errors. Amen? While we're on the topic of language, this is a good one. Next slide. So when you come to Old Testament Hebrew, when you come to New Testament, the modern day, or actually the, in Jesus' time, the Jews, they spoke Greek, Koine Greek, more than they did Hebrew. Some were. Paul was, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, which no, means he knew Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, very fluent. Uh, most of them spoke Greek. Um, because that was the language of the day. So when you have translations, the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew into Greek. So now you've got another issue. You got one original language into a different language, and now we're trying to translate both of those into English. And you'll have problems. You remember Moses when he's up on Mount Sinai, and he's talking to God in a burning bush? And he goes, well, when I go back and I tell those people, they're going to ask me, who sent you? What am I going to tell them? What does he say? What does he tell him? I am. You tell him I am sent you. I am. I am that I am. So it's the Hebrew consonants, because they didn't have vowels. It was just consonants. Y-H-V-H. The earliest manuscripts have Y-H-V-H. But they didn't pronounce the V. It was pronounced as a W. So the later translations changed it from a Y-H-V-H to a Y-H-W-H. Did you know that? You know how they pronounce it? Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. You know what that means? It means to be. It means self-existent one. It means the one that has been, always will be. It's the self-existent, just to be. You say that. Say that with me. That's Hebrew, man. You guys just learned Hebrew. You guys are fluent. I'm going to write you out a certificate. You'll be good. So as time goes on, the language begins to change. So in the Old Testament, you remember uh, Joshua? 
Okay, originally in Hebrew, it was Yeshua. You know why? Because the J was pronounced as a Y. So then eventually as, as language changed, it went from Y to J. So it went from Yeshua to Joshua. You know Yosef? It went from Yosef to Joseph, right? And so the V's they pronounce as a W, then they began to pronounce the V's as a V. So you go from Noah, and you get to the days of King David, who added some uh, vowels in there to give it some meaning, and that's where you get Yahweh. He put, he put the A and the E in there, man. He's like, Yahweh. But they didn't want to pronounce that because they're like, oh, that's the sacred name of God. We can't pronounce that. So then they began to write other words for God, like Adonai and Elohim. And that's why you've got a Bible full of all kinds of names for God. So then by the New Testament come, they did the Y, Yahweh, and the W, way, changed to J and V. And you get Jehovah. Isn't that cool? But let me give you something awesomer. Is that a word? <laughs> Don't tell Rob I said that. The YHVH, the very first one documented in the oldest Hebrew manuscript, and the very newest Jehovah. You know what they both mean, separated by hundreds of years? They mean the self-existent one, to be. Isn't that awesome? So when God says he's going to preserve his word, he's going to preserve it doesn't matter if it goes from this to this to that to this to this to this you're pronouncing this wrong that wrong it's Jehovah. no i don't care it's jehovah oh you're wrong you got the wrong name of god that's the biggest newest thing now you don't you're not saved because you're not saying jesus name right they didn't pronounce the j back in the original greek it's isis what that's dumb i know who jesus is you don't have to tell me about it but here's the issue and i want to say this because this is important so when you go through Judges, you come to uh, chapter 12, and this is, this is a big one, because back in the Old Testament Hebrew, they didn't have the vowels. All they had was the consonants. So they didn't know how to pronounce stuff. And we have problems like that today. Next slide. We, we have problems like that today. This is the letter S in Hebrew. Get rid of those dots up there on top. Because back in the book of Judges, they didn't have those dots. Those dots are for modern Hebrew. And so the one on the left side means that the S is pronounced with an S. I don't know if you know uh, out on uh, 4th Street by the old General Motors, there's a Sars Shalom. Okay, so the Sars would have started with the word, uh, the letter on the left. That's the S. And it's pronounced Sars. Now the letter on the right is an S, but with the dot on the right hand side, it's an SH sound. So the first word would have started with that one, SARS, and the second word would have started with that one, Shalom. SARS, Shalom. S, Sh. Okay, so judges, they didn't have that. So when you come to chapter 12, there's this guy named Jephthah. He's a Gileadite. He's from the half-tribe of Manasseh. He's on the east side of Jordan. And so the uh, Ammonites come to attack him. And so he calls the Ephraimites and says, hey, I want you to come help me. And they're like, nope, we're not helping you. So he's like, fine, whatever. God, am I going to get the victory? God says, yep, go ahead. Boom, gets the victory, gets all of the spoils for the Gileadites. Well, that makes the Ephraimites mad. And they come over and they go, we want your spoils. Why didn't you call us? He said, I did call you. You didn't come. He's like, we're going to burn your house down if you don't give us the spoils. He's like, nope, I'm going to pronounce a curse on you. You try to go back home, you're going to die. So they began to fight the Ephraimites, the Manassites and the Gileadites and the Ephraimites. They're fighting each other, the tribes of themselves. They're fighting each other. And so they said, oh, we got to get back home. we got to cross the River Jordan. Well, Jephthah had already set up a little uh, trap. Any Ephraimite that was trying to get across the Jordan and go back to his home country had to say a word. And if he couldn't pronounce that word, he was killed. And it's funny because it all has to do with difference of translation. They didn't have the dots back in Judges. <laughs> they just had the letter. And it's just like our people today. If I would say, hey, did you park the car in the yard? And you'd be like, yeah, uh, no, it's in the driveway. But if you talk to somebody from Brooklyn, like the Kaz and the Yad, and you'd be like, oh, what? What the heck is that? That's like weird. And you go down to Texas, it's like y'all. You go to Pennsylvania, there's uses. I'm like, what, uses? That's like an English train wreck. Even I know that. But here's the problem. They didn't know it. Tribes were in different areas throughout the land, and they spoke differently. And they only had one language. 
In Judges chapter 12, verse 5 through 6, talking about those, uh, the Gileadites, they captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, let me go over, the men of Gilead would say, are you an Ephraimite? And when that person said, no, then they would say, okay, say Shibboleth. And the person would pronounce it Sibboleth. For he couldn't pronounce it right. And they seized and slaughtered 42,000 Ephraimites. Isn't that crazy? Say Shibboleth. Shibboleth. Oh, no. Well, the same things happened today. In 1937, uh, the the Dominicans killed 20,000 Haitians. Because Haitians spoke uh, with a, a French accent. And as they were trying to come across the border back into Haiti, they told them, and I forget the actual word, but it's a... A Spanish word for um, parsley. You know what that is, Helen? Off the top of your head? Okay. But anyway, with a French accent, it sounds much different than with a Spanish. And so 20,000 Haitians were killed because they couldn't get back into their home country because they said it with a French accent instead of a Spanish. Same thing. It's language. We have barriers. We have things. Even American people speak differently. You go to every different, Pennsylvania's just right here, like an hour or two away from us. And they talk way different than we do. So language changes. People change. Everything changes. Taxonomy changes. How have you met, how are, how are, how are, how are, translate that into English. How many of you ever remember growing up being told that Jonah was swallowed by a whale? Do you know the Bible says great fish? Great fish. New Testament, Jesus said, as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish, three days and three nights, I'm going to be in this earth, three days and three nights. Okay, why do we say whale? Because in modern day taxonomy, that's the biggest ocean creature that we know of. Right? So we're like, okay, probably was a whale because that's the biggest thing we have. But back in Hebrew... Let's go back to Hebrew. Got to go back to Hebrew. In the uh, English Hebrew lexicon of dictionary words for the Semitic domains, the word fish is anything that swims in a body of water. So if you were saw coming up out of the pond, you're a fish. Isn't that what you tell your kids? Gosh, man, that kid loves the water. He swims like a fish. Why do you say that? Because that's just what it looks like, right? Remember the Hebrew people? They just called it like they saw it. So anything that swam in a body of water. Is a penguin a fish? Sure is, according to a Hebrew. Yep. Is a seal a fish? Sure is, according to Hebrew. Is an eel a fish? Yep. And if you know anything about modern science, you'll know that they say 17.5, I don't know where to get to 0.5, 17.5 um, species goes extinct per day. So do we have that great fish that swallowed Jonah? I don't know. Maybe he's extinct now. Could be. Is it possible? Sure. Romans 3, 4. Oh, I caught you napping. Let God be true and every man a liar. Whew. I'm telling you. You got to understand a little bit about the Bible. When I say do your research, I mean do your research. Because the Bible is full of all kinds of wonderful stuff. But if, if you're going to translate it from modern day, you'll never get its definition. Here's the issue. God recorded his word, originally in Hebrew and Greek. I showed you what that stuff looked like. By the time we get it into English, we have problems in the translation. That's why we have a concordance. What's a concordance? It tells you the definition of those words in Hebrew and in Greek. And it shows you why we translate that sometimes. Next week, we're going to go through a very important word. It's going to be kind of a little crazy, but you're going to need to be here because you're going to need to understand it. But God didn't record his word to be a science book. Amen? But everything it talks about in science is 100% accurate, though. He didn't record it to be a historical book. But as every modern-day secular historian, they say that the book of Luke is an absolute 100% historical accurate record. Like, wow, this guy was a historian. No, you don't know, you don't know the Bible. Luke is a physician. But it doesn't matter. When God wanted you to document it, it did its purpose. It's not scientific, but it's 100% accurate. 
It's not a historical old book, but everything that's recorded in there has been proven to be 100% historic. Amen? <laughs> I mean, you, we talk about archaeology. Man, I don't even know if I'm going to get to that. But there is so much stuff to archaeologically back up the Bible to be 100% true and accurate, even when people didn't have the right stuff. But what God did keep his word, and this is, this is what the Bible does say. The Bible doesn't say it's inerrant and infallible. That's what we say. The word of God says that every word of God proves true. And God says, I'm going to preserve my word. And you know what? He has. He has preserved it perfectly. And even though we have translation of translation of translation, we only find out that there's only a pre- 3% error of margin. That's pretty darn good. And no other document that's even survived history has that error, that margin of error. That's beautiful. But God did document his word so that we could have salvation in him. Not just, it doesn't matter whether you believe in Jehovah, Adonai, Elohim, uh, Yahweh, Yahweh. It doesn't matter. Because in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, God recorded his word that from a child, a young child, it can make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ. John 20, verse 30 to 31, John says, Jesus performed all kinds of miracles and signs in the presence of all kinds of different people. And and I didn't record all that stuff, but I recorded this stuff so that you can believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That's amazing. That's why he preserved his word. Matter of fact, in John 17, 3, Jesus says this, He says, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God. There's only one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. And God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are the same, the Trinity in one. That's hard to explain. Never do it. Nor does the Bible say it's a Trinity. But we just understand it from what the Scripture uh, clarifies for us. Old Testament, what man was revealed, he was responsible for. New Testament, Paul says this in Acts 17 while he's on Mars Hill. He says, truly, the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands that all men everywhere repent, because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this by raising him from the dead. Look, God overlooked the ignorance. Didn't matter if he said Yahweh, Jehovah, Adonai, Elohim, doesn't matter. But he says, now my son Jesus Christ came lived a perfect life. He is God. He died for your sins. He paid the price. He went in the grave, and he rose again the third day. And by the power that resurrected him, you put your faith and trust in what he did, you'll have everlasting life as well. That's why God wrote his word, and that's why he documented it and preserved it forever, so that we could have salvation in his son Jesus' name. But look, John three thirty six. John the Baptist says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abides on him right now. Right now. If you die in that condition, your judgment is already set. Your eternal state is already depicted. The decision's already made. God gave us his word so that you can know that you have eternal life. Matter of fact, we have his word so that we can have assurance that we have eternal life. First John chapter 5, verse 13. He says, these things I have written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. Friend, if you're here this morning, my question to you is, even though the Bible has problems and issues, God documented it perfectly and preserved it perfectly so that we could have enough information in our English translation to know where salvation is found. It's found in Jesus Christ, who is God, the Son of God, and in his name you have forgiveness of sin. Do you know if something was to happen to you today where you would spend eternity? You can know for sure. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you, God, for your word. Even though we have problems and issues translating stuff into English and all that, we still know we have your perfect word that gives us salvation, faith in your son, Jesus Christ. And so, God, with some visitors here this morning, I pray, if they've never put their trust in you, there's never been a time where they can say, honestly, that they said, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Save me. Well, then your wrath is on them right now. God, I pray that your spirit would convict them and bring them forward. I would love to show them what your word says it takes to have heaven and eternal life. 
And for your church, man, if, if the New Testament was written and people literally gave their lives to write their own copy, that event that happened, the resurrection of your son Jesus Christ, that event was so important to their life that they were willing to die for it. Your church needs to be defended. They need to have that foundation. They need to answer some hard things so that they can go out and live a life like they did. That was worth dying for. And we say we put our trust in it, but what are we, do- what are we really doing for it? Lord, I pray whatever your spirit would have for us that you would just impress upon your people. Let your will be accomplished. We love you, Lord, and commit this invitation to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.